Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly. And off we go. Before we begin, I'd like to share a resource that many of us, including me, may find a great help, especially now when things are a little weird. BetterHelp.com provides secure online counseling to help with all that mental and emotional stuff that's mucking up our lives. Anxiety, stress, and everything else keeping us awake. BetterHelp matches you with one of more than 4,000 licensed professional therapists. Your counselor works with you the way you like best, text, phone, or video, all from your own home. You don't need to put on a mask or fight for an appointment time. You can just get started right now. If you'd like to join more than half a million people taking charge of their mental health, visit trybetterhelp.com slash boringbooks and get 10% off your first month. That's trybetterhelp.com slash boringbooks or follow the link in the show description. Now, let's get to the reading. Tonight, we're returning to one of your favorite relaxing books, The Coming of the Fairies by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, author of The New Revelation, The Vital Message, and Wanderings of a Spiritualist, illustrated from photographs, and published by George H. Doran Company, New York. 1921 and 1922. Let's pick up where we left off in the midst of his investigations. Chapter 4 The Second Series When Mr. Gardner was in Yorkshire in July, he left a good camera with Elsie for he learned that her cousin Frances was about to visit her again, and that there would be a chance of more photographs. One of our difficulties has been that the associated aura of the two girls is needful. This joining of auras to produce a stronger effect than either can get singly is common enough in psychic matters. We wished to make full use of the combined power of the girls in August. My last words to Mr. Gardner, therefore, before starting for Australia, were that I should open no letter more eagerly than that which would tell me the result of our new venture. In my heart, I hardly expected success for three years had passed, and I was well aware that the processes of puberty are often fatal to psychic power. I was surprised, therefore, as well as delighted, when I had his letter at Melbourne, informing me of complete success and enclosing three more wonderful prints, all taken in the Fairy Glen. Any doubts which had remained in my mind as to honesty were completely overcome, for it was clear that these pictures, especially the one of the fairies in the bush, were altogether beyond the possibility of fake. Even now, however, having a wide experience of transference of pictures in psychic photography, and the effect of thought upon ectoplasmic images, I feel that there is a possible alternative explanation in this direction, 
and I have never quite lost sight of the fact that it is a curious coincidence that so unique an event should have happened in a family some members of which were already inclined to occult study and might be imagined to have formed thought pictures of occult appearances. Such suppositions, though not to be entirely dismissed, are, as it seems to me, far-fetched and remote. Here is the joyous letter which reached me at Melbourne. Quote, September 6, 1920. My dear Doyle, greetings and best wishes. Your last words to me before we parted were that you would open my letter with the greatest interest. You will not be disappointed, for the wonderful thing has happened. I have received from Elsie three more negatives taken a few days back. I need not describe them, for enclosed are the three prints in a separate envelope. The Flying Fairy and the Fairy's Bower are the most amazing that any modern eye has ever seen, surely. I received these plates on Friday morning last and have since been thinking furiously. A nice little letter came with them saying how sorry they were that they could not send more, but the weather had been bad, it has been abominably cold, and on only two afternoons had Elsie and Francis been able to visit the Glen. Francis has now returned to Scarborough at the call of school. All quite simple and straightforward, and concluding with the hope, that I might be able to spend another day with them at the end of this month. I went over to Harrow at once, and Snelling without hesitation pronounced the three as bearing the same proofs of genuineness as the first two, declaring further that at any rate the Bower one was utterly beyond any possibility of faking. While on this point I might add, that today I have interviewed Illingworth's people, and somewhat to my surprise, they endorsed this view. Now, if you have not yet opened the envelope, please do so, and I will continue. I am going to Yorkshire on the 23rd to fill some lecture engagements and shall spend a day with them, and of course take photos of these spots and examine and take away any spoiled negatives that will serve as useful accompaniments. The Bower negative, by the way, the girls simply could not understand at all. They saw the sedate-looking fairy to the right, and without waiting to get in the picture, Elsie pushed the camera close up to the tall grasses and took the snap. End quote. To this letter, I made answer as follows. Quote, Melbourne, October 21st, 1920. Dear Gardener, my heart was gladdened when out here in far Australia I had your note and the three wonderful prints which are confirmatory of our published results. You and I needed no confirmation, but the whole line of thought will be so novel to the ordinary busy man who has not followed psychic inquiry that he will need that it be repeated again and yet again before he realizes that this new order of life is really established and has to be taken into serious account just as the pygmies of Central Africa. I felt guilty when I laid a delay action mine and left the country, leaving you to face the consequences of the explosion. You knew, however, that it was unavoidable. 
I rejoice now that you should have this complete shield against those attacks which will very likely take the form of a clamor for further pictures, unaware that such pictures actually exist. The matter does not bear directly upon the more vital question of our own fate and that of those we have lost, which has brought me out here. But anything which extends man's mental horizon and proves to him that matter as we have known it is not really the limit of our universe must have a good effect in breaking down materialism and leading human thought to a broader and more spiritual level. It almost seems to me that those wise entities who are conducting this campaign from the other side and using some of us as humble instruments, have recoiled before that sullen stupidity against which Goethe said the gods themselves fight in vain, and have opened up an entirely new line of advance, which will turn that so-called religious and essentially irreligious position, which has helped to bar our way. They can't destroy fairies by antediluvian texts, and when once fairies are admitted, other psychic phenomena will find a more ready acceptance. Goodbye, my dear gardener. I am proud to have been associated with you in this epic-making incident. We have had continued messages at seances for some time that a visible sign was coming through, and perhaps this was what is meant. The human race does not deserve fresh evidence, since it has not troubled as a rule to examine that which already exists. However, our friends beyond are very long-suffering and more charitable than I for I will confess that my soul is filled with a cold contempt for the muddle-headed indifference and the moral cowardice which I see around me. Yours sincerely, Arthur Conan Doyle. End quote. The next letters from Mr. Gardner told me that in September immediately after this second series was taken, he had gone north again and came away more convinced than ever of the honesty of the whole Wright family and of the genuine nature of the photographs. From this letter, I take the following extracts. Quote, My visit to Yorkshire was very profitable. I spent the whole day with the family and took photographs of the new sites, which proved to be in close proximity to the others. I enclose a few prints of these. It was beside the pond shown that the cradle or bower photograph was taken. The fairy that is in the air was leaping rather than flying. It had leapt up from the bush below five or six times, Elsie said, and seemed to hover at the top of its spring. It was about the fifth time that it did so that she snapped the shutter. Unfortunately, Frances thought the fairy was leaping onto her face. The action was so vigorous and tossed her head back. The motion can be detected in the print. The fairy who is looking at Elsie in the other photograph is holding a bunch of fairy harebells. I thought this one had bobbed hair and was altogether quite in the fashion. Her dress is so up to date. But Elsie says her hair was close curled, not bobbed. With regard to the cradle, 
Elsie tells me they both saw the fairy on the right and the demure looking sprite on the left, but not the bower. Or rather, she says there was only a wreath of faint mist in between, and she could make nothing of it. We now have succeeded in bringing this print out splendidly, and as I can get certificates from experts, giving the opinion that this negative could not possibly be faked, we seem to be on perfectly safe ground. The exposure times in each case were one fiftieth of a second, the distance about three to four feet. The camera was the selected cameo that I had sent to Elsie, and the plates were of those that I had sent to. The colors of dresses and wings, etc., I have complete but will post these particulars on when writing at length a little later and have the above more fully written out. November 27th, 1920 The photographs. When I was in Yorkshire in September investigating the second series, I took photos of the spots, of course, and the full account of the success. The children only had two brief hours or so of decent sunshine during the whole of that fortnight they were together in August. On the Thursday, they took two, and on the Saturday, one. If it had been normal weather, we might have obtained a score or more. Possibly, however, it is better to go slowly though I propose we take the matter further again in May or June. The camera I had sent was the one used, and also the plates, which had all been marked privately by the Illingworth Company, independently of me. The three new fairy negatives proved to be of these, and can be certified so to be by the manager. The cradle or bower negative is, as I think I told you, declared to be utterly unfakeable, and I can get statements to this effect. End quote. In a subsequent fuller account, Mr. Gardner says, quote, On Thursday afternoon, August 26th, a fairly bright and sunny day, fortunately, for the unseasonably cold weather experienced generally could hardly have been worse for the task. A number of photographs were taken, and again on Saturday, August 28th. The three reproduced here are the most striking and amazing of the number. I only wish Every reader could see the superlatively beautiful enlargements made directly from the actual negatives. The exquisite grace of the flying fairy baffles description. All fairies indeed seem to be super pavlovas in miniature. The next of the fairy offering a flower, an etheric harebell, to Iris is a model of gentle and dignified pose, but it is to the third that I would draw special and detailed attention. Never before or otherwhere, surely, has a fairy's bower been photographed. The central ethereal cocoon shape something between a cocoon and an open chrysalis in appearance, lightly suspended amid the grasses, is the bower or cradle. Seated on the upper left-hand edge, with wing well displayed, is an undraped fairy, apparently considering whether it is time to get up. An earlier riser of a more mature age is seen on the right, possessing abundant hair and wonderful wings. 
Her slightly denser body can be glimpsed within her fairy dress. Just beyond, still on the right, is the clear-cut head of a mischievous but smiling elf wearing a close-fitting cap. On the extreme left is a demure-looking sprite with a pair of very diaphanous wings, while just above, rather badly out of focus, however, is another with wings still widely extended and with outspread arms, apparently just alighting on the grass tops. The face in half-profile can just be traced in a very clear and carefully toned print that I have. Altogether, perhaps, this of the bower is the most astonishing and interesting of the more successful photographs, though some may prefer the marvelous grace of the flying figure. The comparative lack of definition in this photograph is probably accounted for by the absence of the much denser human element. To introduce us in this way directly to a charming power of the fairies was quite an unexpected result on the part of the girls, by the way. They saw the somewhat sedate fairy on the right in the long grasses, and making no attempt this time to get in the picture themselves, Iris put the camera very close up and obtained the snap. It was simply good fortune that the bower was close by. In showing me the negative, Iris only remarked it as being a quaint little picture that she could not make out. End quote. There the matter stands, and nothing has occurred from that time onwards to shake the validity of the photographs. We were naturally desirous of obtaining more, and in August 1921, the girls were brought together once again, and the very best photographic equipment, including a stereoscopic camera and a cinema camera, were placed at their disposal. The fates, however, were most unkind, and a combination of circumstances stood in the way of success. There was only a fortnight during which Francis could be at Cottingley, and it was a fortnight of almost incessant rain, the long drought breaking at the end of July in Yorkshire. In addition, a small seam of coal had been found in the fairy glen, and it had been greatly polluted by human magnetism. These conditions might perhaps have been overcome, but the chief impediment of all was the change in the girls, the one through womanhood and the other through board school education. There was one development, however, which is worth recording. Although they were unable to materialize the images to such an extent as to catch them upon a plate, the girls had not lost their clairvoyant powers, and were able, as of old, to see the sprites and elves which still abounded in the glen. The skeptic will naturally say, that we have only their own word for that, but this is not so. Mr. Gardner had a friend, whom I will call Mr. Sergeant, who held a commission in the tank corps in the war, and is an honorable gentleman with neither the will to deceive nor any conceivable object in doing so. This gentleman has long had the enviable gift of clairvoyance in a very high degree, and it occurred to Mr. Gardner that we might use him as a check upon the statements of the girls. With great good humor, 
he sacrificed a week of his scanty holiday, for he is a hard-worked man in this curious manner. But the results seem to have amply repaid him. I have before me his reports, which are in the form of notes made as he actually watched the phenomena recorded. The weather was, as stated, bad on the whole, though clearing occasionally. Seated with the girls, he saw all that they saw, and more, for his powers proved to be considerably greater. Having distinguished a psychic object, he would point in the direction and ask them for a description, which he always obtained correctly within the limit of their powers. The whole glen, according to his account, was swarming with many forms of elemental life, and he saw not only wood elves, gnomes, and goblins, but the rarer undines floating over the stream. I take a long extract from his rather disjointed notes, which may form a separate chapter. Chapter 5 Observations of a Clairvoyant in the Cottingley Glen, August 1921 Gnomes and Fairies In the field, we saw figures about the size of the gnome. They were making weird faces and grotesque contortions at the group. One in particular took great delight in knocking his knees together. These forms appeared to Elsie singly, one dissolving and another appearing in its place. I, however, saw them in a group, with one figure more prominently visible than the rest. Elsie saw also a gnome like the one in the photograph, but not so bright and not colored. I saw a group of female figures playing a game, somewhat resembling the children's game of oranges and lemons. They played in a ring. The game resembled the grand chain in the Lancers. One fairy stood in the center of the ring, more or less motionless, while the remainder, who appeared to be decked with flowers and to show colors not normally their own, danced round her. Some joined hands and made an archway for the others, who moved in and out as in a maze. I noticed that the result of the game appeared to be the forming of a vortex of force which streamed upwards to an apparent distance of four or five feet above the ground. I also noticed that in those parts of the field where the grass was thicker and darker, there appeared to be a correspondingly extra activity among the fairy creatures. Water Nymph in the beck itself, near the large rock, at a slight fall in the water, I saw a water sprite. It was an entirely nude female figure with long fair hair, which it appeared to be combing or passing through its fingers. I was not sure whether it had any feet or not. Its form was of a dazzling rosy whiteness, and its face very beautiful. The arms, which were long and graceful, were moved with a wave-like motion. It sometimes appeared to be singing, though no sound was heard. It was in a kind of cave, formed by a projecting piece of rock and some moss. Apparently, it had no wings, and it moved with a sinuous, almost snake-like motion in a semi-horizontal position. Its atmosphere and feeling 
was quite different from that of the fairies. It showed no consciousness of my presence, and though I waited with the camera in the hope of taking it, it did not detach itself from the surroundings in which it was in some way merged. Wood Elves Under the Old Beaches in the Wood Cottingley, August 12, 1921 Two tiny wood elves came racing over the ground past us as we sat on a fallen tree trunk. Seeing us, they pulled up short about five feet away and stood regarding us with considerable amusement but no fear. They appeared as if completely covered in a tight-fitting one-piece skin, which shone slightly as if wet. They had hands and feet large and out of proportion to their bodies. Their legs were somewhat thin, ears large and pointed upwards, being almost pear-shaped. There were a large number of these figures racing about the ground. Their noses appeared almost pointed and their mouths wide. No teeth and no structure inside the mouth, not even a tongue, so far as I could see. It was as if the whole were made up of a piece of jelly. Surrounding them, as an etheric double surrounds a physical form, is a greenish light, something like chemical vapor. As Francis came up and sat within a foot of them, they withdrew as if in alarm, a distance of eight feet or so, where they remained apparently regarding us and comparing notes of their impressions. These two live in the roots of a huge beech tree. They disappeared through a crevice into which they walked, as one might walk into a cave and sank below the ground. Water Fairy, August 14, 1921 By a small waterfall, which threw up a fine spray, was seen poised in the spray a diminutive fairy form of an exceedingly tenuous nature. It appeared to have two main colorings, the upper part of its body and aura being pale violet, the lower portion pale pink. This coloring appeared to penetrate right through aura and denser body, the outline of the latter merging into the former. This creature hung poised, its body curved gracefully backwards, its left arm held high above its head, as if upheld by the vital force in the spray, much as a seagull supports itself against the wind. It was as if lying on its back in a curved position against the flow of the stream. It was human in shape, but did not show any characteristics of sex. It remained motionless in this position for some moments, then flashed out of view. I did not notice any wings. Fairy, elves, gnomes, and brownie. Sunday, August 14th, 9 p.m. in the field. Lovely, still, moonlight evening. The field appears to be densely populated with native sprites of various kinds. A brownie, fairies, elves, and gnomes. A brownie. He is rather taller than the normal, say, eight inches. Dressed entirely in brown, with facings of a darker shade, bag-shaped cap, almost conical, knee breeches, stockings, thin ankles, and large pointed feet, like gnome's feet. He stands facing us, in no way afraid. 
perfectly friendly and much interested. He gazes wide-eyed upon us with a curious expression as of dawning intellect. It is as if he were reaching after something just beyond his mental grasp. He looks behind him at a group of fairies who are approaching us and moves to one side as if to make way. His mental attitude is semi-dreamlike, as of a child who would say, I can stand and watch this all day without being tired. He clearly sees much of our auras and is strongly affected by our emanations. Fairies Francis sees tiny fairies dancing in a circle, the figures gradually expanding in size till they reached 18 inches, the ring widening in proportion. Elsie sees a vertical circle of dancing fairies flying slowly round. As each one touched the grass, he appeared to perform a few quick steps and then continued his slow motion round the circle. The fairies who are dancing have long skirts, through which their limbs can be seen. Viewed astrally, the circle is bathed in golden yellow light, with the outer edges of many hues, violet predominating. The movement of the fairies is reminiscent of that of the great wheel at Earl's court. The fairies float very slowly, remaining motionless as far as bodies and limbs are concerned, until they come round to the ground again. There is a tinkling music accompanying all of this. It appears to have more of the aspect of a ceremony than a game. Francis sees two fairy figures performing as if on the stage, one with wings, one without. Their bodies shine with the effect of rippling water in the sun. The fairy without wings has bent over backwards like a contortionist, till its head touches the ground, while the winged figure bends over it. Francis sees a small, punch-like figure with a kind of Welsh hat doing a kind of dancing by striking its heel on the ground and at the same time raising his hat and bowing. Elsie sees a flower fairy, like a carnation in shape, the head appearing where the stalk touches the flower, and the green sepals forming a tunic from which the arms protrude, while the petals form a skirt, below which are rather thin legs. It is tripping across the grass. Its coloring is pink like a carnation, in a pale, suffused sort of way. Written by the light of the moon, I see couples a foot high, female and male, dancing in a slow, waltz-like motion in the middle of the field. They appear even to reverse. They are clothed in etheric matter and rather ghost-like in appearance. Their bodies are outlined with grey light and show little detail. Elsie sees a small imp reminiscent of a monkey revolving slowly round a stalk to the top of which he was clinging. He has an impish face and is looking our way as if performing for our benefit. The brownie appears during all this to have taken upon himself the duties of a showman. I see what may be described as a fairy fountain about twenty feet ahead. It is caused by an uprush of fairy force from the ground and spreading fishtail fashion higher into the air. It is many-hued. 
This was also seen by Francis. Monday, August 15th, in the field. I saw three figures racing from the field into the wood, the same figures previously seen in the wood. When about a distance of ten yards from the wall, they leapt over it into the wood and disappeared. Elsie sees in the center of the field a very beautiful fairy figure, somewhat resembling a figure of Mercury without wing sandals, but has fairy wings. Nude, light curly hair, kneeling down in a dark clump of grass, with its attention fixed on something in the ground. It changes its position. First it is sitting back on its heels, and then it is rising to its full kneeling height. Much larger than usual, probably 18 inches high. It waves its arms over some object on the ground. It has picked up something from the ground, as I think a baby, and holds it to its breast and seems to be praying has Greek features and resembles a Greek statue, like a figure out of a Greek tragedy. Tuesday, August 16th, 10 p.m. in the field, by the light of a small photographic lamp. Fairies. Elsie sees a circle of fairies tripping round, hands joined, facing outwards. A figure appears in the center of the ring, at the same time the fairies faced inwards. Goblins. A group of goblins came running towards us from the wood to within fifteen feet of us. They differ somewhat from the wood elves, having more the look of gnomes, though they are smaller being about the size of small brownies. Fairy Elsie sees a beautiful fairy quite near. It is nude with golden hair and is kneeling in the grass, looking this way with hands on knees, smiling at us. It has a very beautiful face and is concentrating its gaze on me. This figure came within five feet of us, and after being described, faded away. Elf Elsie sees a kind of elf, who seems to be going so fast that it blows his hair back. One can sense the wind round him, yet he is stationary, though he looks to be busily hurrying along. Goblins. Elsie sees a flight of little mannequins, imp-like in appearance, descending slantwise onto the grass. They form into two lines which cross each other as they come down. One line is coming vertically down, feet touching head. The other comes across them shoulder to shoulder. On reaching the ground, they all run off in different directions, all serious, as if intent upon some business. The elves from the wood appear to be chiefly engaged in racing across the field, though no other purpose appears to be served by their speed or presence. Few of them pass near us without pulling up to stare. The elves seem to be the most curious of all the fairy creatures. Francis sees three and calls them goblins. Fairy A blue fairy, a fairy with wings and general coloring of sea blue and pale pink. The wings are webbed and marked in varying colors, like those of a butterfly. 
the form is perfectly modeled and practically nude. A golden star shines in the hair. The fairy is a director, though not apparently with any band for the present. Fairy Band There has suddenly arrived in the field a fairy director with a band of fairy people. Their arrival causes a bright radiance to shine in the field, visible to us sixty yards away. She is very autocratic and definite in her orders, holding unquestioned command. They spread themselves out into a gradually widening circle around her, and as they do so, a soft glow spreads out over the grass. They are actually vivifying and stimulating the growth in the field. This is a moving band which arrives in this field, swinging high over the treetops, as if from a considerable distance. Inside a space of two minutes, the circle has spread to approximately twelve feet wide and is wonderfully radiant with light. Each member of the band is connected to the leader by a thin stream of light. These streams are of different color, though chiefly yellow, deepening to orange. They meet in the center, merging in her aura, and there is a constant flow backwards and forwards among them. The form produced by this is somewhat like an inverted fruit dish with the central fairy as the stem, and the lines of light which flow in a graceful even curve forming the sides of the bowl. This party is an intense activity, as if it had much to do and little time in which to do it. The director is vivified and instructed from within herself, and appears to have her consciousness seated upon a more subtle plane than that upon which she is working. Fairy Elsie sees a tall and stately fairy come across the field to a clump of harebells. It is carrying in its arms something which may be a baby fairy, wrapped in gauzy substance. It lays this in the clump of harebells, and kneels down as though stroking something, and after a time fades away. We catch impressions of four-footed creatures being ridden by winged figures who are thin and bend over their mounts like jockeys. It is no known animal which they bestride having a face something like that of a caterpillar. Amongst this fairy activity, which appears all over the field, one glimpses an occasional gnome-like form walking with serious mane across the field, whilst the wood elves and other imp-like forms run about amongst their more seriously employed fairy kind. All three of us keep seeing weird creatures as of elemental essence. Elsie sees about a dozen fairies moving toward us in a crescent-shaped flight. As they draw near, she remarked with ecstasy upon their perfect beauty of form. Even while she did so, they became as ugly as sin, as if to give the lie to her words. They all leered at her and disappeared. In this episode, it may be that one contacts a phase of the antagonism and dislike which so many of the fairy creatures feel for humans at this stage of evolution. Francis saw seven wee fairies quite near, weird little figures lying face downwards. In the Glen, August 18th, 2 p.m. 
Frances sees a fairy as big as herself, clothed in tights and a garment scalloped round the hips. The whole is tight-fitting and flesh-colored. She has very large wings which she opens above her head. Then she raises her arms from her side up above her head and waves them gracefully in the air. She has a very beautiful face with an expression as if inviting Francis into fairyland. Her hair is apparently bobbed and her wings are transparent. Golden Fairy One specially beautiful one has a body clothed in iridescent, shimmering golden light. She has tall wings, each of which is almost divided into upper and lower portions. The lower portion, which is smaller than the upper, appears to be elongated to a point, like the wings of certain butterflies. She, too, is moving her arms and fluttering her wings. I can only describe her as a golden wonder. She smiles and clearly sees us. She places her finger on her lips. She remains watching us with smiling countenance in amongst the leaves and branches of the willow. She is not objectively visible on the physical plane. She points with her right hand, moving it in a circle round her feet, and I see a number, perhaps six or seven, cherubs with winged faces. These appear to be held in shape by some invisible will. She has cast a fairy spell over me completely subjugating the mental principle, and leaves me staring wild-eyed in amongst the leaves and flowers. An elf-like creature runs up the slanting branch of the willow from the ground where the fairy stands. He is not a very pleasant visitor. I should describe him as distinctly low class. And with that, I think we'll end this evening's reading from The Coming of the Fairies by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This book continues to be an absolutely fascinating investigation, not only of fairies, but of the way we come to conclusions. I hope you continue to enjoy it as much as I do. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, and see the photographs of the fairies described. As always, you'll find a link to a free ebook version from Project Gutenberg in the show description. The description also includes links to ways you can support this podcast, including one-time donations via buymeacoffee.com or becoming a subscriber on Patreon where you can receive access to exclusive episodes of Boring Books for Bedtime found nowhere else. I'm so glad you could join me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.